the labs. We're a behavioral design firm. We use behavioral economics to increase users' health, wealth, and happiness. And we were co-founded by leading thinkers in the field, Dan Ariely and Kristen Berman. And we really work with lots and lots of companies around how do we take behavioral insights and make better products. So we run experiments, we've done tons of training. Um, we were originally part of the Google uh, econo Behavioral Economics founding team. And this is, you know, we wouldn't be behavioral scientists if we didn't have a social proof slide. So we kind of poke fun at ourselves and, and, and jokingly call this our social proof slide of some of the companies uh, that we've worked with. Okay, so let's dive into the topic at hand, the reason why everyone's here, the behavioral science of big decisions. Now, what qualifies as a big decision, right? We know that the behavioral science has said a lot, we've done a lot of research on all these interesting areas. How do we get people to maybe go to the gym one more time per week or eat more vegetables or you know, medication adherence? These are all topics well studied by behavioral science. And, and what's the line of deciding? Like, why did we make this topic of big decisions? And I, I'm gonna kind of admit it's a little bit arbitrary because we know from the research, right, one of the biggest contributions of behavioral science is in the area of retirement. And so this quote unquote, small decision of whether you check the box or not, these types of things, do I go ahead and, and set up my retirement has huge financial impact. We know that programs like Save More Tomorrow have impacted um, long-term savings of probably more than 15 million Americans. So whether that, you know, that's a small decision with, with, with big impact, seemingly small, but, but big impact. Nowadays, we also know that the COVID vaccine is a similar thing. It seems like a small decision, but probably, you know, for some people, life or death stakes here. So I'm kind of admitting that I, I picked it a little bit arbitrary, arbitrarily and stuck with what we most, what we would call kind of traditionally big decisions. And I also biased it to stuff that I wanted to talk about. Um, so we're going to talk about these four Probably a glaring, uh, you know, thing that's not on here is whether to have a child, um, but there's only so much time, and so we'll need to cover that for another session. So three themes that we'll see today is how the environment, the system that we use, shapes our behavior. Right, whether we use a dating app, shapes how we make dating decisions. Um, we use shortcuts for when things are complicated. We tend to like to simplify and use shortcuts and rules of thumb. And we're bad at thinking about trade-offs and opportunity costs. So these are themes that we'll, we'll see sort of woven in today. Okay, let's start with job, uh, kind of an easier one. Let's think back to when we were maybe graduating college and which job we should take. So maybe let's put in chat, how do you pick if you have multiple offers? What is the thing that you should use to, to pick the job? Okay, pros and cons, your gut, <laughs> Michael Bloomfield like it, prestige, personal values. Okay, so how are you comparing these two different jobs? Yeah, alignment, really nice. Okay, so th these are nice inputs from chat. How do people actually pick? It turns out that the job with the highest pay is the one that most typically wins, right? That's the research, what the research shows. And even if we're thinking about com comp, we should probably think about it on more than that level, right? We should probably include benefits because there's certainly a world where benefits, you know, in one job, you know, let's could say there's better healthcare. Your total comp might be better uh, with a job with a job with with a lower salary. So that's one one piece. The next piece is just thinking about, of course, what, who's the manager? Who, what's the team like? What's the size of the company and potential for advancement? These are all relevant things. Now let's say that, um, Sorry, one quick question for my co-hosts. Can we let in all the people in the waiting room because the pop-ups keep coming up? Can we just change that default? That would be wonderful. Sorry, folks. Okay, let's keep going on this and assume that there are multiple cities, right? If we think back to college, very often we got offers from more than one city. How do we think about that? That changes things a lot, a lot more complexity there. We should think about cost of living public transport, right? Am I gonna to have to buy a car? Or do I have other friends moving there? What's the unemployment rate? These are all relevant things. You know, I put gender ratio here. This is kind of a, a funny one. We don't think about this traditionally kind of at all, but you think about a city like San Diego with high male, uh, uh, more men than women, or a city like New York with more women. This actually changes the dating dynamics 
significantly. The way people can measure this, by the way, is on which date couples first have sex. Any guesses when, when there are more women and more men versus more men, what happens to that? On which date they do it? Let's put it in the chat. Curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give exact uh, numbers, but basically, what happens is when women are more in power, the date shifts to a later date when they first have sex, and when men, when there's more women um, in the dating market, and therefore men have more power, uh, the couples have sex at an earlier date. So these are things. This is just an illustration of. Gender ratio is probably an important consideration. We just don't think about it. There's just so many things to consider when we're looking at a job offer that we tend to simplify and we just use salary. This is the easy simplification rule of thumb that we use. Like I said, the data kind of shows it. Um, and this is this principle of like, whenever we have complexity in the world, we don't like this. We use heuristics, we simplify, we use kind of rules of thumb to think about hard decisions. Okay, let's move on to the second category, a fun one, dating um, and choosing a partner. Principles that we're gonna look at here, choice overload, salience, defaults, and sunk costs. So let's start with choice overload, probably a really easy one, obvious one to start with. Everyone's on the apps now. Apps is the most common way for people to meet. Um, it's the, the most common way by far now, actually. Uh, compared to all of the ways we used to meet. And what does this mean, right? This, this means that we've changed this idea of choice. We have so many more options. And culturally, we think of this as like a wonderful thing. We, you know, think about, especially in the United States, it's kind of this cultural value of like, more choice is always better. And I think the question here is, is that always necessarily true? Let's look at this study where people were given the choice of chocolates. So let me give you six chocolates. I'm putting these six chocolates in front of you. Um, would you like, you know, go ahead and try these. And then at the end, I ask you, you know, do you want to buy one of these? And then the second group put 30 chocolates in front of you. <laughs> try one of these, go ahead and make your choice. And then I ask you questions about, okay, how satisfied, how much do you enjoy this chocolate? How confident are you that that was the best chocolate to choose and you shouldn't have chosen one of the other chocolates, right? These questions, when we think about um, our satisfaction with the choice, it becomes a little bit different. So the results here are that the purchase rate was higher with the six chocolates because it may be an easier choice to make among six than 30. But more importantly, the point I wanna make here is around satisfaction. There's a differential in satisfaction when we have uh, a much broader choice set like this. Okay, another study that I like here is one that was done on photography students. So these students were kind of at the end of their program and were asked to select one of their photographs um, that would be sent off for printing. We're gonna be sending this to England, it's gonna be printed for you and you're gonna receive it, wonderful. And the two conditions were that, hey, I'm going to, um, once you make your choice, you are going to be kind of, this, this is it, right? And then the second, second uh, population, second condition was told, hey, you can switch your choice if you like. Any predictions, let's put this in chat, on which group was um, more satisfied with their choice, with their, with their, their, their painting in the end? No discipline. Non change. Yeah. So this is this idea of optionality, right? This idea of, oh, I can go back and switch it. We tend to, again, culturally like this idea of let's keep all of our options on the table at all times. And it turns out the group that kind of had to choose and stick with it was more satisfied than the group that had this ability to switch out. And so, what's the parallel here with the dating market? This idea of this. Oh, I'm dating you now. It's fine. It's great. But you know, this other, this with the apps kind of present on our phone, how easy is it to just swipe? When the next best thing is just to swipe away. So that mindset can have kind of uh, happiness costs for us here. Well being costs. Another, we could think of the analogy of imagine you have an apartment. And let's say 
let's break the suspend reality for a second and pretend that we don't um, have a traditional lease, but instead we have one in which uh, we negotiate it every single day. You get to renew it every single day. So I turn to you and I say, hey, I'm the landlord, I'm the landlady. And I say, do you want to renew today? Yes or no? And you get the choice and you get to decide yes or no. And then the next day you get to decide again. And then the next day you get to decide again, you know, from a pure rational economic standpoint, this is ideal. <laughs> you have long, no long-term tie and you have a complete optionality here to go uh, move wherever else you like. My question for you is how well would you treat this apartment? How would you think of this apartment? If there was a small thing that happened, you knew how to repair it, would you repair it? You know, would you buy plants for it? All of these questions, right? It, the parallel here is that relationships are better when we invest in them. And this idea of, you know, this world where something is the next swipe away and every day, imagine again with your partner, every day you wake up and I look at you and I, and I say, oh, am I, are we gonna do this for another day? Are we gonna do this for another day? So there's something about um, being just in this moment and kind of in this relationship now uh, in an experiential mindset rather than an evaluative one. Okay, let's look at, this is a, a screenshot of the Bumble app. And what, what stands out to us from this app, from this screen here? Anyone wanna put in chat? Circles, yeah. Multiple people gave, yes, absolutely. So this is kind of doing a design. This is absolutely suggesting that you should be talking to multiple people. And I like that, especially, it's not like it's full six, right? There's a, the cutoff here that's clearly suggesting even more, right? To, to be talking to even more. And so this, it, this is creating this mental model of we should be talking to multiple people. And I'm not saying we can go in and you know, change the Bumble app. I, I would love to, by the way, talk to talk to them or, or any dating app about how they've designed things. But we can, for ourselves, right, Jerry rig the process for ourselves. If we know that this kind of mindset, this all this choice overload affects our decision making, we can pretend that it's like this. We can pretend that let's just have three active conversations at a time. And everyone else, we kind of just you know, slot out. We we keep we we use behavioral science to say let's just talk with three um, and manage uh, the choice overload accordingly. Okay, let's look at this. These are two more screens uh, from dating apps. What stands out here? What are the features of these humans <laughs> that are being highlighted to me? This is kind of like yeah. Putting what what what's being made salient? How what stands out? I'm looking at chats again. Age, height, location. Yep. Photo, physical stats, job and height. Absolutely. So these are the things. The design of this app is essentially telling me these are the things that we should be picking on. Right. This person's 28. This person's 31. Five nine. Five seven. It's almost like it's there's probably some truth right the, to the idea that uh, i'm sure there's some data i haven't looked this up but there, i'm sure there's some truth to the idea that women have some kind of bias around height strong preference for um you know you know wanting to know height but this kind of design making it this salient putting it this much in the forefront is almost taking an existing kind of bias and amplifying it this makes me think of airlines there's probably an existing pre baseline preference for people that, you know, they probably did some research and customers said, we really just want a cheap, the cheapest flight. Make us make, clearly, clearly show what the price is. And so this sort of design leads with price and it doesn't tell me about what's the total duration. We're not in any salient way, right? It's really small here. What's the on-time rate of these different flights? All of these factors that we should be probably considering in our choice, we're not, instead of we're over choosing on price, um, as a counter to that, we can look at this. This is a lovely screen from a Canadian train that is making salient something we don't typically make salient, which is productive time, right? Train, look at how much productive time you have versus these other modes of transportation. So the product has a lot of power here in pulling forward what should we choose on. And I would argue that this is pulling a lot of the kind of wrong things. There's nothing about the fact that this 
guy likes skiing, that means necessarily we're going to be great long term partners. There's no correlation between that. These are not predictive, right? Um, and so this is a kind of a challenge of, of the dating um, landscape as well. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next principle here and talk about um, defaults. Again, really obvious behavioral science principle. I'm sure everyone's aware of it. We see it from the research. Most famous examples probably in retirement savings. If you default people in versus not, huge impact on whether they sign up for retirement. I want to challenge you all to think of how defaults might play in for dating. Any suggestions? You can do this in chat again. Or if you're really bold, you can unmute. Default status preferences, use the dating preference uh, filters. Yeah, swiping on your first option. Yeah, yeah, these are <laughs> nice. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward, by the way, when we do the breakout, because you guys are very, have a lot of ideas and, and I can share them further there. So two ideas that I have here that I wanted to chat about is, one is we should probably be defaulting to more than one date, right? We're not looking, when we're thinking about a long-term partner, we're not selecting for who is good at first dates, right? In the same way that we, you know, it doesn't matter that someone likes hiking or whatever that has the same hobby as you is not, that's not predictive. In the same way, we don't want to, it, it's almost like the system favors people who are good at taking good photos, are good at, um, you know, um, you know, peer, you know, doing that coffee interview date. That's not life. Life is not about coffee interviews. Um, and so we should probably default to more than one date. That's one uh, idea around defaults. The other uh, idea around defaults is a little bit different. And it's that we, uh, there's some evidence that we, we tend to slide sometimes in relationships and we just progress to the next level of the relationship by default. So imagine that you've been dating for however many months and then one of your lease is up and you kind of look at each other like, well, I guess we should move in together, right? <laughs> so someone's lease being up is not a reason to be moving in together, right? We should be making more proactive uh, choices uh, on whether we do want to take it to the next level. If so, wonderful. And if not, uh, maybe not do so, right? The, 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 the fact that your lease is, is expiring is, is irrelevant uh, to this. Okay, one more. Let's suspend reality for a beautiful second and pretend that there's no COVID and we get to go to a play without any worries. And we've, uh, in one scenario, we paid $200 we went there and we did waited in line for two hours to get these tickets. They're very hard to get. And we go to the play and the first act is just terrible, just horrible. Do we leave at intermission? Do you go and do something else with your time? That's one question. Scenario two, a friend of yours gave you tickets because she couldn't make it. And the same thing, first act is terrible. Do you leave at intermission? What are your votes here? Can, it, can anyone explain? Anyone want to uh, uh, say why is this different? Leave it free. <laughs> Stay. Uh, I, mean, I, I have optimist. an opinion about it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I say it's just because you're already like more invested into it, not not just in money, but um, you spend time mm -hmm. as well. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you for being a brave soul to unmute. It makes us feel together. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, Absolutely. So this is some cost we've invested into it. So even though at the moment, at this exact moment where the first act is terrible, going forward, we should be able to make a quote unquote rational decision and just say, well, going, it's irrelevant how much I've put in, you know, is my time worth uh, the probability of the second act being good or bad is not different in these two scenarios, right? Is my time worth this? Should I walk away or not? And yet you're exactly right. This investment that we've put in um, impacts how we see, how whether we decide to, to move forward or not. And this plays in very much in relationships as well, right? So imagine you've had, you know, spent X many months or even years in a relationship. Maybe the relationship isn't so great right now. And you're, you're questioning, do I want to move forward with it? or not, but we have this huge bias of the time and energy that we've invested into it. 
And so one exercise here could be, let's suspend reality, again, like using behavioral science on our own life or good. So we say, let's pretend I don't have that history with this person and I'm just meeting them today, knowing everything that I know about them, but, I, but we don't have these years of, of history together. Would I start this, a new relationship with them? Would I start it all over again? And I think if your answer is no, I think that's telling you something really important. It's very uncomfortable, right, to face that reality. And it's almost a hard question to even ask ourselves. But I think it's a useful exercise to do. OK, wonderful. So to not end on that downer for the dating section, I want to uh, flip it around a little bit and say and end on a different piece, which is let's rethink coffee dates, right? Kind of back to what I was saying before. We're, we're choosing someone as a life partner and whether you're good at a coffee date is, is not relevant. And there's something about coffee dates um, that is just that, that kind of interview mindset, um, this evaluative mode. And so let's, let's think broadly. Uh, one idea here is going whitewater rafting, right? Kayaking, these types of things where maybe something could go a little bit wrong. Maybe there's small moments of stress along the way. How does this person react? when things don't always go perfectly. <laughs> do they blame you? Do they, you know, how do they, are they optimistic? Are they positive? Do they focus on the solution? These, these might be relevant things. Um, I'm sure you can think of many more ideas, but this is just the suggestion here is to challenge the idea of the coffee date. So we went over a lot for dating. So I'm gonna just go recap for us. <laughs> An experiential versus evaluative mindset, right? Not this like, oh, I'm not sure about this. I've got kind of one foot out the door. The next best thing is just to swipe away. Managing our choice overload. So one tip could be like, just jury rig it. Limit your active conversations to three, maybe. Um, default to a few, you know, three dates, maybe two. Um, don't go to the next level by default. And you know, managing our sunk costs. So if we wouldn't necessarily pick them today, maybe you shouldn't be in that relationship. And then finally, we ended on going beyond the coffee date. Okay, let's talk about egg freezing. Topic three of four. This is a, uh, I think an, an unusual one. We probably don't talk about this enough as societies. So I wanted to, to add this one into the mix. Behavioral principles at play. We're going to talk about complexity, uh, rules of thumb, availability and salience, optimism bias, and mental models. Here we go. Okay, so this is similar to the job scenario. There are lots and lots of inputs to our fertility. Yes, age matters a lot, but so does BMI. All of these other input genes, these, these things matter a lot, but somehow we don't like to deal with the complexity of this. It's hard. And so we've kind of created a simplification said for women and kind of said, well, age is kind of the most important thing that matters. And we don't talk enough about these other elements. It's just too complicated. The other thing that's happened is we've kind of made up this magical number of 35, um, which has actually nothing to do the, the history of that comes from the 70s. And it has to do with um, genetic testing um, for Down syndrome. Um, and other, other kind of chromosomal issues like that. So the, it, it, there's no magic number around 35. It's just kind of this rule of thumb oversimplification that we've created. So let's kind of, I think one takeaway there should be like, if, if women are kind of interested in this, you should probably just test for fertility early on and kind of drop this idea uh, of 35. Okay, let's do another uh, poll here and we can play a game. We're gonna launch this in just a second. Rank these causes by number of deaths in the United States. So we've got shark attacks, accidental falls, and lawnmower injuries. And Lucy, I'm going to let you run this because I can't see <laughs> anything <laughs> about the poll running, but I trust you. You got it. It's running. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for participating. We're getting some speedy responses. Awesome. Love it. People are excited. Or I'm going to yeah. just, my optimism bias is going to have you me interpret that as excitement. Great. I'm going to close this off in five, four, three, two, one. All right. And what did people and say? The results are we're getting 1% for shark first 
and 83% for fall first lawnmower shark. Um, 14% for lawnmower fall and shark. So awesome. honor, yeah, honorable mentions for choice A and D, but okay, he is great. the one. Great. So this wasn't an exercise so much in ranking, but what I want to point out here is just the magnitude of the difference. Like I was shocked. This is this first number, by the way, is from the CDC. Like I didn't make this up from some random <laughs> website. Um, this is from the CDC. Accidental falls over 35,000 per year is just at a whole different scale of sharks. And yet sharks, if anyone, you know, raise your hand if you've heard some story in the news at some point about sharks and shark attacks and oh my gosh, and it be, you know, it's available in our mindset. Yeah, thanks, you use it, raise your hand feature. I was meaning just like physically, just raise your hand, but cool, um, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, just look at the magnitude of difference here, right? This is, it. we see, we hear stories of this, it sounds dramatic, we have this image of this scary shark that, that hits us, our, our brain, in a very different way uh, than this idea of like, oh, okay, falls. I, from a rational standpoint, you guys, you guys got the answer right, that there's something visceral about this kind of, this availability bias of how easily we can kind of recall a moment um, that would make us guess. Next time, if I do this webinar again, I'll or use these slides again, I'll actually get, have people guess the number because I, I, can, I can see just, um, I, I, you know, transparently, I would have never guessed 35,000 a year, anywhere near so high. And so what's the parallel here? The parallel here is we just see celebrity headlines. Again, raise your hand if you've seen something like this. Janet Jackson gives birth at 50. <laughs> or like if ever you had, a, you know, so if maybe you've mentioned to like someone that you might be considering egg freezing. Oh, honey, you don't have to worry about that. Did you know my, my relative so-and-so had a baby at 48? You kind of get these, these really helpful feedback from people that like, oh no, it's possible. But statistically, you know, these things are very much anomalies, 48 or, or 50, but they're, when we hear stories like this and they're, they're kind of magnified, they're amplified in our brain in terms of the probability of them happening, right? So we're kind of um, misinterpreting what the true statistics are by, by having uh, salient stories like this. Okay, so I mentioned optimism bias. Let's play another little game here. Um, we're gonna do a poll in a second, not yet. Um, this is a study by Tali Chereau, where she asked people what the probability of an adverse event was. So the types of things that she gave were like getting cancer or being in an earthquake or, uh, you know, other accidents, diseases, et cetera. And, uh, you know, let's say they said 50%. I, I estimate my chance of this bad thing happening to be 50%. Okay. And then we're gonna have some experts look at this and we're gonna crunch your data and look at your health history and et cetera. We're going to tell you, actually, it turns out that your chance is only 30%. Would you like to go back to your number and change it? Please, please go back and put in a new number if you'd like. And so what did people put on average? They adjusted. Okay, great. I'm just going to adjust it. The experts told me 35%. Good to know. What happens if they started with a low number? Some people picked a really low number. Oh, only 10% chance that's going to happen to me. And the experts come in and say, hey, we've looked at your situation, it turns out you might have 30% chance of this adverse event, say it's cancer or whatever. What happens here? Let's do a poll when they're given the chance to change their percentage. What do they do? Sorry. What do we have? Okay, and I'm gonna end it in five, four, three, two, one. Um, so 44% of people said that they had a 15% chance um, going on afterwards. That's That was the first choice. And okay. the other ones were equal. <laughs> okay, thank you. There you go, sharing the results for everyone. Oh, wonderful, thanks. Um, okay, so what we see here, is that people basically ignore into almost entirely the expert's recommendation and they stick with their original belief that this, this bad things are gonna to happen to other people and not to me. The chance of anything bad happening to me is very low. 
by the way, this, this the, I think that one of the best examples of optimism bias is if you ask um, divorce lawyers right as they're you know brand new like newlyweds like cool what do you think your chance of divorce is what do they think they say zero <laughs> they're divorce lawyers they probably know the statistics better than anyone and yet we all have this and it's actually you know from a human standpoint a beautiful thing I, i'm very happy that we have this optimism bias the only people who kind of don't have opt optimism bias are um clinically depressed unfortunately so optimism bias generally for humans is probably a good thing for the space of fertility for the space of egg freezing can be a little challenging because we might underestimate how um whether we should do whether we might need any kind of fertility assistance later um and we might underestimate how many eggs um, a woman should freeze so let's just do this one how many eggs should a woman freeze for 90 percent chance of one baby we're not talking about multiple just one and just chose the first 90 percent chance uh we're going to do a poll for this so chris and anitra you guys are <laughs> anchoring <laughs> um funny that I can't see these polls, by the way, but it's okay. I'm just, you know, I'm sorry. This is, no, 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 don't apologize. <laughs> don't apologize. This is, um, this keeps it fun for us. Let's let people, yes, no Google, Google cheating, by the way. No four, Google cheating. Three, two, one. All right. Um, so 50% of people said you would need to freeze 20, more than 20 eggs, mm -hmm. um, followed by 17% of people who said, I have no idea. I respect that. Nice. <laughs> and then we got 12, 10, we got 15, 10, five um, awesome. in order of eggs you need to freeze. Awesome. Thank you so much yeah. uh, for reading that out. I appreciate it. And I apologize. Yeah, sorry for everyone else. You, 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 I'm sure you can see the, the screen that, that we see, or I hope you can see the, the screen that she's sharing. Um, okay, so let's go to the answer for this. Dun, dun, dun. This is a, uh, chart what we have here on the left i'll just talk through it, this is the number of eggs that you need um, let's ignore the egg donor column most people don't do that and over at the right here is the age, and so what I did here is I highlighted 90 and above, and so if we had to kind of create a rule of thumb here. Uh, you know it obviously depends on age, etc, but if we had to create one, it would certainly uh, I, I would put it at 30 or more. And so if you think about the number of eggs that are retrieved on an average cycle, which is between eight to 14, what this means is typically you need more than one uh, process, one, one uh, cycle of egg freezing. You might need two, you might need three to get to this number of eggs. Um, and we just don't go in, like if I think back to myself, I did egg freezing many years ago. The first time I did it, I was so proud of myself. Oh, I took care of you know, I did such a this smart thing and I'm in my future and I'm doing, I didn't have anywhere near the right number of eggs, but I just kind of had it in my head. It's like, I checked that box, I'm done. No one explained to me, no one sat through, like, I, I don't, I think it's a hard conversation for doctors to have given how expensive it, expensive it is and kind of setting that expectation. And often, yeah, you might need more than one cycle. So I think this is kind of a challenging space and you kind of combine this with optimism bias. Um, and we probably have many women under freezing uh, the number of eggs. And I kind of want to touch on this as well, uh, this question of mental models. How do we think of egg freezing? What is it most like? Obviously it's kind of a unique experience. Um, anyone have any ideas of if there was a product or service that it's most like, what does it fall into? Okay. Anecdotally, when the way people talk about egg freezing, if you look up articles on this, if you look at celebrity quotes, what people say is they're like, oh yeah, I wanted an insurance policy for myself. That's our closest mental model that people use to think about egg freezing. It seems similar enough. Unfortunately, it's really not. It's dangerous to think about it as an insurance policy. And the biases that are coming into play here is we think of, oh, it's expensive. Each cycle is a lot of money and you're paying out of pocket. And it's not the most fun. You have to inject yourself, you get hormonal. It's kind of the, the fact that it's expensive and hard makes us more likely to think that there's a guaranteed payout. 
but that's not how it works, right? The insurance policy, if you have a policy for like, oh, if there's a fire to my house, I get this, or if there's a um, hurricane that happens, I'm gonna get this paid out. That's going to happen. There's no guarantee just because you go through an egg, egg freezing cycle that you get any eggs at all. Um, and even if you do, they, they don't necessarily turn into to, to babies in the, in the long run. So I think this is just a, it's a fraught and it's a difficult, you know, challenging space. And I think we should be having better conversations uh, about this as a society. Okay, so takeaways here. 35 is not a magic number, uh, suggestion to test early, not to treat frozen eggs like an insurance policy and freezing enough eggs. This often uh, involves more than one cycle. If we had to pick a rule of thumb, I would pick the, the number 30. Okay, our last topic before we get to go into breakout rooms, and I hope that people uh, stay for those and, and wanna, wanna chat with each other and get to know who else is in the room. Okay, buying a house, relativity, anchoring, sunk cost, and mental accounting. So let's talk about how are housing decisions made? How should we think about which house do we get? What features does it have inside of it? What are the, all of the elements that, that we want? What's the location of the house? Is it close to a school? Is it close to a, all of these things are relevant, right? And how do people actually make decisions? Let's look at just this question of uh, the size of the house. And in this study, they were looking at folks coming from places like San Francisco, which have a very high cost of living, and uh, places like Gadsden, uh, Alabama, which is a low cost of living, and moving to a place like Pittsburgh. And I think this is a relevant conversation for today, especially with COVID and all we, we're all kind of, or many of us are kind of shifting seats. We're going to, to different places. Uh, people are, are, are shifting their lifestyle because of, of the kind of remote and work from home situations that we're in. And so the question here is what happens, right? San Francisco or Gadsden, Alabama moving to Pittsburgh. And for the purpose of this um, analysis, what they did is they held constant people's uh, kind of wealth, right? So we could assume here, like it, it would be easy to be like, oh, well, the San Francisco person is wealthier than the Alabama uh, person. But again, in this analysis, they controlled for that. And so what did they find? San Francisco, moving from San Francisco with the same wealth level as someone moving from Alabama, moving to Pittsburgh, ended up with larger homes than smaller homes. So what's happening here? I'm gonna unmute or put in chat. Why is this happening? Why is the San Francisco person ending up with a bigger house in comparison to the uh, Alabama, Gatson, Alabama person when they're in? Sounds like anchoring to me. <laughs> yeah, there's some relativity, absolutely, process anchoring. Yeah, there's homes in the San Francisco Bay Area. People are used to being like, oh, there are multiple millions. And so all of a sudden, you, you know, they, these homes uh, seem cheaper, right? Absolutely. Anchoring, relativity, both related concepts. There's no inherent value in something. We, the way humans we determine value is relative uh, to other things. So uh, similarly, you, you raise your hand if you may have experiences, if you've gone to look uh, at homes, your agent might show them to you in a specific order, right? Okay house, okay house, pretty nice house. <laughs> because the, the pretty nice house seems even better if you've seen these other kind of mediocre homes first. Um, two other ways we might think about um, relativity is with upgrades. So imagine that you have, you're buying a new in a new development and often in new developments, you're, you pick the house and you pick the location, but they get to ask you a bunch of questions like, hey, do you want this type of granite countertop? Do you want this or that um, addition, additional things? And so what happens is we say, well, I'm paying a million dollars for this house. So $10,000 more for this granite countertop? Yeah, no big deal. It seems small in comparison to that big number. So we're more likely to just kind of do these add-ons, even though earlier today we went to the grocery store and we were trying to buy ingredients for a salad. And you know what? I'm going to buy tomatoes instead of cucumbers because the tomatoes are on sale. So I'm going to save a dollar and 37 cents by doing that, right? So this, we kind of ignore this idea of absolute value and we uh, kind of double down on relativity. The other concept where relativity or example where relativity absolutely comes into play is 
thinking about the Joneses. So this concept of keeping up of the Joneses, we all are familiar with, right? And the idea here is we should be careful about choosing which who are our Joneses. So I, I, I would almost say, let's not even try to not keep up with the Joneses. We just should admit we're likely going to try. And so more actionable is, should we just be careful what Joneses we pick? What I mean by that is if you look at, so a good example is um, lottery winners, looking at the data there, looking at their neighbors. So what happens when somebody wins the lottery? What happens to their, you know, you just want the lottery, you spend more money, it's visible to everyone. What happens to their neighbors? Any guesses? They start spending more money as well. Sadly, the statistics show that neighbors of lottery winners do spend more money and are actually more likely to, to go into bankruptcy. So just be the takeaway here is be careful on who you pick uh, as your Joneses. Okay, so for the home stretch here, we're gonna go into specifically, like let's pretend we're looking. I want to look at the tools. Remember, we talked about how the tools can, the environment, right? The systems that we use can shape our decisions. So let's say we're using one of these calculators. Um, I just went online, searched for one, found this one. Where am I looking to buy? Typed in zip code, all of this financial information. I made up some numbers there just to have screenshots for this. And it told me in my little made up exercise, um, 596. Oh, actually, let, let, what stands out to you before I? Happy to have you unmute if anyone wants to, to share out too. Or chat. What stands out? Monthly payment. The monthly stands out to you. Interesting. Okay. Okay, I would argue that this number is the kind of big one. And if anything, we should probably make the monthly a little bit larger. Um, but absolutely, we're kind of anchoring on two, two numbers here. Um, yeah, so I, I think this one, we're kind of really kind of amplifying this. Everyone's probably familiar with this idea of anchoring. We've now set this idea of like, this is the number that I'm going to focus on. And very likely, I'm going to end up with a home close to that, even though it's, you know, for all we know, I should or, or could look at homes that were, were much less, but we've now anchored me on that number. And I would say, yeah, so my point here would be, we probably are under anchoring on this one. Look at the relative size of the two. You know, the, the HOA costs matter. So there's a world where you could be under budget for the home price, but actually your monthly payment ended up with an expensive HOA being much higher. So th that, that's worth considering as well. Okay, so let's continue down this imaginary home buying process. And let's say we, you know, set our criteria, we, searched, we went to all these different homes, we found this one that we really like, and it's 550,000, beautiful little blue house, I start in that, I go to it, I start thinking about uh, which furniture I want to put where, where I'm going to put this artwork, you know, uh, the things that I'm going to do in this wonderful home, there's a great bakery across the street, they have wonderful croissants, I'm going to be going there, there's a dog park, okay, oh, I'm kind of envisioning this life that I'm going to have in this home. And I put an offer in, and what happens next? Anyone? Anyone been? I'm just curious. Raise your hand if you're kind of been recently in the home buying market. What's going to happen next after you put the offer in? It's going to escalate. <laughs> it's going to escalate. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, so the agent comes back and is like, you know what? The other people they they offered this much. What are you going to do? You're going to go up. Because what's a little bit more, and you're going to, and you're, you're kind of attached to this home now. You have seen your, you envision this, this life there. Um, I'm just going to cut to the chase here because you guys kind of get the, get the gist of where I'm going with this. This is a concrete. This is a real example. This home went up for sale, I believe, um, in June, and in August it sold for seven hundred thousand dollars. So this is very common. These sort of bidding wars that happen, and this is our friend. This is our familiar friend sunk cost. We've invested so much into it. And it's just, what's a little more? What's a little more when really in some scenarios we should really be walking away. So one tip here is to avoid that little slide that just automatically happens. Just a little more, just a little more, just a little more. Write down your number in advance. And just the reason I'm saying writing it down, it's harder to shift the number that's actually physically written down than one that's in your head where we just slowly kind of shift it over time and we cheat. Okay. 
one last thing to close us we're going to do renting versus buying i'm going to go quickly on this lots of assumptions here you know it, it, the whole math depends on the assumptions but really what i want to talk about here is um, this model mental model that we have of renting as throwing away money and buying as investment so let's pick the you know renting at 3k a month similar how the house is exactly the same let's say buying would be at 1 million annual cost would be if we multiply that out by 12 months 36,000 and in the case here of buying let's assume we have 250,000 for down payment which means our loan is 750 interest rate I you know currently three percent I did a kind of just some assumptions here it's tax deductible property tax upkeep picked a low amount and so this by the way a key key detail here is we are not this does not this is an interest only loan for the purpose of this assumption so we're not including any principal we're not owning the home in any way this is just the math of just to to kind of play the game here right? the, the cost that if we're thinking about throwing money away it, these are the two uh, equivalents here question for you what's missing if we're doing this comparison what's missing maintenance opportunity cost the maintenance is probably a little low that's that's one thought yeah yeah so whoever just said opportunity cost is right equity is also another one um for the purpose of this exercise we can you know let's just assume for shits and giggles that it's we're at the top of the market and home prices are not um gonna go, go up and so we're not going to increase that so this is what i'm talking about absolutely so let, let's put the down payment invested at five percent here which because brings us to 12.5 which brings us overall to 23.5. So this is really just kind of showing, I wanted to break this mental model. And, and, and again, this is just one exercise. The key here is just for you all to do your own, you know, there are wonderful calculators out there, go and, go and fill them in. And so it's not, should, should not always be our assumption that, um, you know, one is an investment and one is always throwing away money. Um, and the other point here is, yeah, opportunity cost neglect. To, to be aware of that, to, to ignoring kind of what we have given up by, by tying that 250K down as a down payment. And this idea of mental accounting, we might think of an, uh, this uh, interest cost, we think of it very differently uh, because of the mental bucket uh, that goes in and we, it, because we think of it as an investment. Okay, so very quickly, takeaways here, ignoring our anchors, ignoring what city you're from or whatever your bank, approval rate is for, for a home purchase, paying attention to monthly payments, not just the price, not overspending on remodels and upgrades, picking your Joneses carefully, not getting in bidding wars, setting a max for yourself, writing it down, and don't assume buying is always a better investment. So we talked about a lot of principles. We're going to uh, send you to the breakout rooms in just a minute, but I'd love for everyone to put into chat if, if you have one, one takeaway that you want to walk away from uh, today. What's one thing you're gonna to go to your partner or your colleague and be like, hey, did you know such and such? Since it's my birthday. Oh yes, I'm happy so birthday. Happy, thank you. So I'm so happy to have joined you right now. <laughs> well, That's my takeaway is, oh, I, I participated in Irrational Labs. <laughs> well, I take it as a huge compliment for you to join us. Um, on your birthday. Thank you so much. Thank you for folks. Uh, yeah, for everyone to, to, to have spent this this time with us. Uh, I'm thrilled, consider myself very lucky to be able to, to, to share these insights and hope, hopefully, you know, this fun with you all. If you're all interested more, we have uh, lots on our website in terms of interesting content, case studies we've done. We have a boot camp um, that we teach behavioral science methodologies to folks. And uh, yeah, check us out.